What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Big Ten Takeover podcast presented by the Takeover Sports Network. I am your host, Donovan White, and today we are covering the Michigan State Spartans. We're going to look at back, them, back at them for 2021, see how their season went. We're going to preview them for 2022. Uh, but as always, uh, we here at Takeover Sports and with the Big Ten Takeover podcast, our partner with Prize Picks, uh, they've got a special offer for all of our listeners and viewers, right? Any new user that deposits and uses the promo code TAKEOVER, We'll receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. Price picks is the easiest way to play daily fantasy and more. You can pick two to five players and an over under on their projections and win up to 10 times on any entry. It's just you versus projected numbers. Price picks has a ton of stats to choose from, including points, rebounds, assists, three pointers made, fantasy points, and more. They even allow mixed sport entries. So, for example, you could take the over in the fall on you know Patrick Mahomes over passing yards, but at the same time, take the under on Saquon Barkley's rushing yards. Uh, Price Picks offers you every sport you can think of: NFL, college football, MMA, soccer, college basketball, MLB, NBA, whatever it is, they've got it. They have an award-winning, easy-to-use mobile app, which you can find both on the App Store and Google Play. Price Picks entry can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. So if you're looking for fun and an easy way to play daily fantasy, make picks, whatever it may be, be sure to check out Price Picks and don't forget to use the promo code Takeover so they know we sent you. That's Price Picks promo code Takeover. As I mentioned earlier, we are covering the Michigan State Spartans. And, you know, Michigan State is a team coming into the season last year. They didn't have a ton of, high, you know, high expectations. It was Mel Tucker's second year. Uh, you know, they, they came off of a, a weird year. Everyone had a weird year with 2020 with the COVID year. But they were coming off, you know, kind of an underwhelming performance as to be expected in a new coach's first year. But coming in, it wasn't that they were projected to be, you know, what they ended up finishing. Uh, but whatever their expectations were, um, for themselves and, and as, a, as a country, they certainly eclipsed that. Um, they, they ripped off a hot start starting off 6-0, and 6-0, and and which included wins against, at the time, the top 25 Miami Hurricanes didn't finish that way for them. Um, Nebraska, Northwestern, Rutgers, so other Big Ten teams that in and, and previous years they've struggled against, you know, in, in the past few years before Mel Tucker. Uh, at one point after certain 6-0, and they entered the top 10, which was just astounding considering where they were in 2020. But it was something where you're realizing Michigan State's, you know, they haven't beaten anyone that marquee yet, but they're they're here to play in the Big Ten. They're here to compete. Um, and they entered a you know rivalry game with the Michigan Wolverines, ranked in that top 10, um, a dramatic come-from-behind win uh, against the Wolverines, which with some, you know, questionable play calling or some questionable referee calling from uh, from that game. But after that win, they debuted at number three in the initial college football playoff rankings, which, again, was shocking to see just from a team that didn't have many expectations coming in and certainly didn't have even close to that success in 2020, uh, albeit in Mel Tucker's you know first year. But the second year, rising that high, rising that quick, there was a team that just, you know, they surprised everybody. The very next week, though, after that number three ranking, the college football playoff rankings in the first week, uh, they lost to Purdue. Uh, so it kind of really hampered their playoff hopes. Uh, when it came to, you know, kind of controlling their own destiny, they needed to have, you know, maybe another win against Ohio State. May, maybe a couple of things happened for them to, to, to sneak their way back in. But their, their playoffs hopes were still alive. Um, they took care of business against Maryland after that loss, Purdue. And they set up a huge showdown with Ohio State in Columbus against the Buckeyes. And unfortunately for the Spartans, they got blasted 56-7. I was at that game. I, listen, as a Buckeye fan, I was a little nervous. I was wondering, I said, okay, you know, you know, Shorey defense by Ohio State, Michigan State, yeah, sure, they slipped up against Purdue, but they've got an elite running back. They can kill you with that ground game, that play action a little bit. Two good receivers in Jalen Naylor and Jaden Reed. Uh, I was a little worried, and it just seemed that they were flat. I don't know if it was the moment or if it was just kind of, you know, that energy and that excitedness, that hype burned out up to that point. I don't know what it was, but Michigan State got waxed at that point. Um, and to, to their credit, they finish off the season strong. They beat Penn State, which, again, Penn State's kind of been in the upper echelon of the Big Ten in the past few years, while Michigan State hasn't been since about 2015, 2016. Close out the season with a win against them. Went to New York Six Bowl and beat you know Pitt in the Peach Bowl, albeit without Kenny Pickett. Um, and they finished the season ranked in the top ten, which is their highest since 2015. Uh, when they were when they were kind of up in that same uh, range when it comes to the college football playoff rankings. Um, and then after the season, they agreed to a 10 year, ninety five million dollar contract extension with Mel Tucker. So it was certainly a success uh, for Mel Tucker, who got nearly one hundred million dollars 
uh, to his name after the season. But the thing with Michigan State that, again, is so surprising is I, it, I don't know if it's more of a testament to the players or to Mel Tucker or to a mix of both, but the, the buy-in that they had as a program, right, to his culture, to his belief, um, maybe it was they needed a clean house for some of those seniors that were there or some of the guys that transferred out, I'm sure, after 2020. But whatever it was, they truly bought in to Mel Tucker's mission. And it showed immensely <clears throat> in 2021. And it carried them pretty through. I mean, it was a 10-win season, uh, you know, 10 point, double-digit win season. Uh, they beat one of their rivals in a, a thrilling game. Again, they fell short against Ohio State and Purdue, which ultimately probably kept them out of the college ball playoff. But it was a, it was a season where Michigan State – was defined kind of as what you'd expect them to be, a ground and pound, right, strong defensive front, strong offensive line, strong run game. Uh, and and they just – they dominated the team. They, they won games in the Big Ten that way. And that's – you know, outside of teams like Ohio State, which has some of that speed, you do get – that. that's how Big Ten teams – that's how Wisconsin wins. That's how Iowa wins. That's how Michigan won this year. That's how Michigan State wins when they do it. Um, and, and so they did that. They, they absolutely did that. And so what I'm curious about – is going forward some of these departures that they had, um, some of the expectations that they had coming back from 2021, coming into 2022. I don't know if that's going to weigh on them too much. I don't. I, I don't know if. I, I. I'm curious to see how that affects them because once you hit that level, right? Even though Mel Tucker is only going into his third year, um, and this is true not just in Big Ten or just not just for Michigan State, but at a lot of schools, even if it's a newer coach, the moment you kind of hit that success. And especially when you're a program like Michigan State, we are not, you know, Rutgers. You're not Illinois. You're a program that has had sustained success and sustained top success, upper echelon success in the conference and nationally plenty of times in the past. Once you hit that threshold of success one time, especially early on in a coach's career, you're kind of expected to say, okay, now what? You hit this, maybe a little bit of a drop off, we get it, but you you do not go from a double digit win, you know, winning season to you know 500 that would be devastating um to the to the team kind of the morale and kind of the momentum they have going on and so i'm curious to see if those expectations weigh on them a little bit because again they are a, a very good big 10 program i don't think they're an elite college football program but they're good enough that once those expectations are placed it you know it's hard to tell that fan base now we got to take a step back now we got to wait a little bit they're expecting and rightfully so they're expecting this team to take a step forward so when it comes to 2022, obviously big departure, Kenneth Walker III. Um, I thought he, him and Brees Hall, I thought him, him and Brees Hall were probably the two best running backs coming um, in, you know, out of the draft this past season. Uh, Kenneth Walker III, leave it to him, especially with a running back room that doesn't have a clearly defined, you know, guy to, you know, heir apparent to take his place. Might be more of a running back by committee situation, uh, but he's going to be a big loss. Um, uh, Jalen Naylor, who was a wide receiver that Josh Taylor with the draft takeover podcast. And I talked about last week, um, getting drafted the Minnesota Vikings. I thought he was a stud again. I thought he was underutilized in an offense where Peyton Thorne, um, no, no, you know, no disrespect to him, but I don't think he's that elite of a quarterback, um, that good of a quarterback. So it, it, it's tough for a guy like Jalen Naylor with his, his skill set to shine in that offense, but they'll lose him as well. And then they lose three starters among the offensive line, their offensive line, they had a nine man rotation, which is, you know, it can be a good and a bad thing. Uh, it could be good if, if you're nine deep, but it can also be bad if you have to play nine guys because you're injured or the rest of the other guys aren't very good, but they lose tackle AJR Curry uh, center, Matt Allen, and then guard tackle kind of mix um, Kevin Jarvis. So three guys up front and then a few other guys that were also rotational pieces uh, but again, in that nine-man rotation, played a lot, but three defined starters. Um, that's one of my biggest concerns. Along with them, they lost fullback, his tight end, Connor Hayward. So they lost a lot of pieces on offense. They, they, I don't believe I'm, – I'm not too sure with that, with that style of offense that they had last year where it was ran through Kenneth Walker the third, And you kind of saw when Peyton Thorne had to make plays on his own, especially – you saw it pretty early against Ohio State. You can go back watch the first quarter. When they got down – Kenneth Walker didn't really get the ball much, and it was out of necessity. It wasn't he was hampered. It wasn't that he was hurt. It was they needed to throw the ball to stay in the game, try and stay in the game. And when you saw that, when they had to do that, you saw what happened with Peyton Thorne. Um, he kind of fell apart a little bit. So you take away, you know, three of his starting offensive linemen, one being his center and one being his tackle, uh, which, uh, again, center and tackle, in my opinion, are probably the two most important positions on the offensive line. T center, you can make the argument they are because of all that communication they provide up front. But when you lose that, you lose – you know, Jalen Naylor, stud wide receiver, you lose Kenneth Walker, your literal entire offense. 
more pressure is going to be applied to you, especially like I mentioned, when you have a running back by committee, most likely scenario coming in when you've got young guys starting up front on the offensive line with, again, I three starters left, but I think three more rotational pieces left as well. So you're going to have young guys with that are inexperienced guys um, coming into play. And they're, they're big 10 caliber recruits. And even more than that, they're Michigan state caliber recruits, which is higher in the big 10. But that being said, they're still young. They're still inexperienced and they're going to need to carry that momentum and carry that response for that pressure of having that season um, replicated, you know, from last year to this year, they're going to have to, they're going to have to be um, similar to what Wisconsin and Iowa does where they reload and revamp that offensive line year in and year out. Usually uh, Michigan State's going to need to have that happen kind of the same effect that Iowa Wisconsin does in order to sustain that similar success we saw last year. That being said, despite all the departures, they do have some key returners. Um, Xavier Henderson um, is a stud safety, might be the best safety in the Big Ten. He comes back to man kind of that back end of the defense. Jaden Reed, wide receiver. Um, him and Jalen Naylor, I think, might have been the most underrated wide receiver duo in the country. Jaden Reed had over 1,000 yards receiving and over and 10 touchdowns. I think, again, he's a guy that – He's going to put up similar stat lines to um, this next season, just like he did last year, or maybe even more more similar to Jalen Naylor, but it's going to be hampered when it comes to his quarterback play. Um, and maybe it's hampered because their running game just isn't going along, so you can't open them up in the play action more. Uh, and so they have to try and rely on the pass game more, which I don't think is a, the best strategy for Michigan State going into this season. But Jaden Reed's a guy I think is, is going to be one of the top – when I say top receivers, I don't mean – top two, but I'm thinking top four, top five receivers in the Big Ten. I'm really high on his game, um, and I like what he can offer. And then, of course, Peyton Thorne, um, and I, I'm not too high on him. Um, I think it was 27 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, 6% completion rate uh, last season. So he's not a bad quarterback per se. I just think he's a, about a, a true game manager as you can get, uh, maybe a step above you know, a pure game manager. He's got some some ability in there, but, and it's no shot against him. I just don't think he's a CJ Stroud. I don't think, I don't even think he's a Talia Tonga by low out of Maryland who can really make some plays and really splash a little bit. And again, Tonga by low out of Maryland's a little inconsistent at times, but he can make those splash plays. Peyton Thorne, I don't think is a guy that can do that. That being said, he is still your starting quarterback. And anytime you bring in, bring back your starting quarterback, even if they aren't, you know, elite of the elite, it still does help your team, assuming you know they're above average. So it still will be a plus them instead of having to start someone else behind him who, you know, more more inexperienced or you know just not as talented. So that'll help them again. I'm not the highest on him, but it's going to help to have Peyton Thorn back, especially with an inexperienced backfield and offensive line uh, um, coming next to him. Some new faces: Amir Speed, cornerback from Georgia, is going to help bolster that secondary of Michigan State a lot. Um, and in his name, Speed, he's going to add some of that SEC speed on the Michigan State team. I expect him to shine pretty pretty well. And then Brian Green, offensive lineman from Washington State. And I think he's probably going to need to step in and play a lot of meaningful snaps for Michigan State. Um, and he's probably going to be a big – he's going to be a big presence in terms of his experience because um, he's going to be an older guy. And he's going to have to show some of that experience um, even if – all of his talent doesn't catch up to it, right? And this is no shot against him, but I just – I don't know how talented this guy is coming from Washington State, but he's going to have to outperform his talent level. He's going to have to um, in order to keep that Michigan State Spartan momentum trucking along. So they've got a few new faces. Again, their, their recruiting class isn't necessarily upper echelon of the Big Ten, but it's certainly not at the bottom. Uh, my biggest concern with their departures and their returners and some of their new faces – Honestly, it's always going to go back to Kenneth Walker III. He was such a dynamic running back. And th there's a difference, I think, when you have guys, whether it's the Big Ten or any conference, that um, you can tell are good running backs, but there's nothing that special about them. So when you shut down the offensive line or when you throw out different blitzes or game plan around them, you know, they kind of shut down. This is a guy that, they, you know, teams knew what Michigan State was going to do. They they knew that even though they had Jaden Reed and Jalen Naylor, that the quarterback, well, you know, albeit solid, wasn't going to make a crazy amount of plays to beat an opposing defense if you shut down Kenneth Walker. Third. It's not like they could shut down the run game and then Michigan State come back and say, okay, we'll just, you know, throw it to two of our, you know, very good receivers. Teams tried to stack the box. They tried to stop Kenneth Walker third, and it didn't work. Um, he was a legitimate beast. And so I think that's going to be the presence they miss the most coming into 2022. And again, I don't know how they replicate it. I really don't. And I think that is going to be the driving force 
on why they have a little bit of a decline going into next season. And we'll go through their schedule in a second. But I, I think Spartan fans, if you're out there listening, it's not necessarily a shot to say that you take a little bit of a step back. The success that they had last season was so out of you know left field and so um, culture changing for Michigan State that and I'm not saying the players are expecting, you know, kind of disappointment or expecting to take a step back. But as a, you know, Big Ten conference and as fans of the game, I, and me, me especially, I, I would understand if Michigan State takes a step back. And I wouldn't really hold it against them because to use all of that momentum and all that hype and all that juice that was in the program after they started off 6-0 and and after they got ranked and after they beat the Miami Hurricanes and after they beat Michigan and after, you know, they were ranked number three, to get all of that out and really replicate it going forward, especially when you lose that talent, still returning talent. Again, I'm really high on Jaden Reed. I'm high on some of those guys in the front seven. I'm high on Amir Speed coming from Georgia. They bring some talent back, but I do think they take a step back as some other teams in the Big Ten, not even necessarily take a step forward, maybe even just maintain. But I think this is where Michigan State kind of takes a little bit of a step back. So going through their schedule real quick, they play well home against Western Michigan. Um, I think that's a win. Western Michigan – um, while I do love to represent the Mac, um, Western Michigan is one of the, the the more upper echelon teams of the Mac conference, but I don't think they'll, they'll be able to beat Michigan. Um, Akron, uh, Akron is not at the top of the uh, upper echelon of the Mac conference. They, um, as I mentioned plenty of times last fall with Josh Taylor and Blaine Gilmer on our CFB Unfiltered podcast um, and show, I, I always mentioned that Akron might be the worst football program in the country in terms of D1 FBS programs, and I stand by that. Um, so I think don't think Michigan State will have a problem taking care of Akron in week two. Week three, they play at Washington, which, you know, in, in normal years, I'd say Washington might get that win. But Washington's program is is not doing too hot right now. They're thin on recruiting. They're thin on talent. A lot of guys transferred out. They're changing over coaching staff. So I don't think that's going to be an issue for Michigan State. Um, once I took a deeper dive into it, I was like, yeah. Washington's not going to be able to, not going to be able to hang with Michigan State, even if that some of that talent is gone. Week four, they play home against Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota, I think, is somewhat not necessarily make or break year, but there's a lot of expectations with Tanner Morgan coming in, um, who I think is a quality quarterback. And I don't think PJ Flex on the hot seat at all. But there is some kind of okay, you had some good seasons in the past with PJ Flex. What are you going to do now? You know, what are you going to do coming back? Um, with your same quarterback, with your returning quarterback, with some other returning playmakers. I still think Michigan gets the win, especially because it's at home. I think that helps. The next four games is maybe it's some hot takes, but this is where I see things kind of changing a little bit, fading a little bit for the Spartans. They play at Maryland, and Maryland is one of my sleeper teams. I'll be honest. I really like Talia Thungabailoa. I think Maryland gets the dub against Michigan State, and I think that's the first beginning of kind of the slide of Michigan State because I think they're going to come in ranked in the preseason top 25. I really do. And I think probably after Western Michigan, Akron, Washington, Minnesota, assuming they beat them all you know, comfortably or even just beat them, um, I, I think they'll be in the top 20. There's no reason they shouldn't, uh, maybe even top 15. And when they play at Maryland, I think is when they get the first loss of the season. And it does not help them that the following week, even though it's home, they play Ohio State. And I think that is another loss for them right there. They put then they play home against Wisconsin again, help some home against Wisconsin. But after that two game skid, they're going to be trying to kind of get back to it. And I don't think they're going to beat Wisconsin. So for the third week in a row, I think they're going to lose. And then not even to help them again, they go and play at Michigan. And unfortunately, unfortunately for the Spartans, Michigan remembers that dramatic, thrilling victory that I talked about earlier, and they will be angry. Michigan will be angry. Despite all their success that Michigan had last year, um, they're going to be angry um, against the Spartans. Again, it turned out fine for the Wolverines in the end. They made it to the playoffs. They won the Big Ten. But I guarantee you they don't. They didn't forget that loss. I guarantee you they didn't want to lose to Michigan State despite going to the playoffs, despite winning the Big Ten championship. So I think they lose to Michigan. Then they close out the season. Uh, Illinois, Rutgers, and Indiana. Um, I think they're going to win all three of those games at Illinois, home against Rutgers, home against Indiana. I don't think any of these programs will um, – it could be closer games, maybe especially Rutgers or Indiana, depending on how they're looking this year. Um, but I don't think it's going to be – I don't think they're going to get the win against Michigan State. And then their last game is season, they play at Penn State. And I'm giving Penn State the win with this only because once, in my opinion, once they beat Illinois, Rutgers, and Indiana, they'll be bowl eligible. Um, and I think at that point in the season, if, you know, the tide, if the dominoes fall the way I'm predicting it to, 
by that point, you know, they'll be out of – they won't be ranked after four straight losses, uh, most likely. They won't be – they'd be sitting there at 7-4. Um, they probably wouldn't be ranked. They'd be locked – or 6-4, and four, excuse me. They'd be locked into a bowl game. Um, uh, you know, they, they'd be locked into a bowl game. And I, I think at that point when you – we kind of talk about carrying that momentum. When that momentum's gone, right, when that momentum from last year is gone, it's from that hype and it's kind of like, okay, we did take a step back this year. I think that's when – playing at Penn State. And again, this could all change if Penn State completely collapses, which we'll talk about in a future episode with them. Uh, but I don't I don't see Penn State being a three and nine, four and eight team at worst. I see them being probably the same as Michigan, Michigan State, you know, seven and four entering that game. And I think if they're both on equal playing field or if Penn State's a little bit, you know, higher if they're playing for a little more, I think at you know Penn State on their home turf is going to get that win. So overall, I'm projecting Michigan State to be seven and five overall. And Spartan fans, it's not a shot at the program. It's not a shot um, against what those players did last year, what they're going to do this year. Um, I just think some of that juice is burned out a little bit, especially with the losses on their offensive line, um, with the loss of Jalen Naylor, and again with that loss of Kenneth Walker third, even Connor Hayward, you know, fullback tight end. People don't understand how vital a fullback, a great fullback is to an offense when they can block and when they can move a little bit. And Connor Hayward was a guy that helped a lot in that run game. It wasn't just those three offensive linemen that left, you know, went off to go explore their NFL career. Um, and it wasn't just Kenneth Walker. That Connor Hayward played a huge piece and he's missing as well. So I'm projecting seven and five overall for the Michigan State Spartans. Again, no shade to them. I, I think they had a great year last year. I just don't think they have an encore performance in 2022. Um, that being said, I, I, it's it's not a not a shock to it wouldn't be a shock to see some of these losses that I predict to be flipped. It wouldn't shock me if Mar if they end up beating Maryland, right? It wouldn't shock me if they end up beating Wisconsin. It would shock me if they end up beating Penn State either. It would shock me if they beat Ohio State. And quite honestly, I would be a little surprised if they beat uh, Wisconsin or Michigan. Um, I'd, I'd be fairly surprised, especially against Michigan. Um, so, you know, that seven and five record could easily be 10 and two, um, you know, nine and three, 10 and two, maybe even 11 and one if things fall the right way. I just don't think their talent um, that they lost a lot. I don't think the talent coming back and coming in this year is going to, um, you know, kind of uh, compensate for the talent that they lost last year. So that's my take on it. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. Did I get it right? Seven and five, you know, a little too low. Is it too high? You know, I hear you Wolverine fans out there. Maybe it's a little too high in your guys' books. But um, let me know what you think. Uh, we're going to keep previewing the rest of the Big Ten Conference. We've covered Michigan. We've covered Wisconsin. Today we covered Michigan State. We're going to keep going with Iowa, with Rutgers, with Northwestern, with Ohio State, with Penn State. We're going to talk about all of it in preparation for the Big Ten season. I'm super excited. I, I feel like last season was kind of the – the really come back here from, from the 2020 COVID year, um, which again, I played in, I played in the 2020 year with COVID. That was my last season. And it was certainly different than going to watch games last year. There was a different energy. And I think that energy carries over in a huge way um, for college football in general as a whole. And, and for the big 10 conference, especially I think big 10 country, the Midwest and, and these States right here are hungry for some more good football. Um, and so that's, that's my take on it. We'll cover more of those teams, kind of get ready for that excitement. The NFL draft is over, so you still got some NBA playoffs, some MLB going on. But for us football um, fanatics, we need something. <laughs> we need something before um, NFL training camp, before preseason games, before you know Big Ten camp comes along. So that's all I've got for you today. As always, I'm your host, Donovan White, and I will catch you next time. Mm -hmm.